Breaking the gray. Sarah Turner, Rebel Scientist, alert, yes. we're back, we're back. We're back. I want to start every episode off with, we have another technical issue, but <laughs> I would love to start an episode off where we didn't have a technical issue, but today it seems we had another one. So again, we're here, we made it through, we got through it, and Sarah, where are you in the world today? Are you back on the island? I'm back on the small island. Yes, I'm back on the small island. A little bit harried because of the uh, drive around the M25, but all good. All good. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, it sounded like you were in the car today for three hours driving around. Did you see anything fascinating on your drive? Uh, no, a lot of cars. A lot of cars parked on the M25 is what I saw. Oh, but gosh. yes, it's nice to be back home for a while. Well, we loved having you here in the United States. You're leaving. There's just a little a little part of us died when you left. So we'd love to have you come back. Of course. And, you know, it's a story is when we were looking for a guest for today, because we want to talk about microdosing, and I was looking for an expert in microdosing, because although I know lots of people who do microdose, I don't know anyone who's, you know, this, this is their expertise. And so our guest is going to be Marshall, and we're going to say hello to him in a minute. But the reason, you know, I was so excited to have him on is because he, when I checked out his LinkedIn, it said Santa Cruz, which is obviously where I live for a while, and which is where you are. So that's super cool. And hi, Marshall. Thank you so much for putting up with us and our, our constant technical gremlins. But thank you. And it's so lovely to see you. I hope, you know, you can send us a little bit of Santa Cruz sunshine today as well. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Thank you both so much for having me. Absolutely. And I live in Half Moon Bay, so I'm not too far from you. So we're pretty close. I'm not there today, but I normally am there locked in my basement recording podcasts with you, with people. So it's great to have you. So microdosing, are you high now? <laughs> no, I'm not. I actually, I wouldn't say that my expertise is microdosing. It's psychedelics more broadly. And then microdosing, I guess, falls under that umbrella. Nice. Right. Yeah, we'd love to get into it. Sarah and I have talked to a few psychedelic experts here, but we'd love to dive in. For sure, Marshall. Please share where you got into it, because I know it's a, such a growing field. And so it's so interesting. So maybe you can start from the beginning how you got into it. Yeah, sure. It's sort of a convoluted path. In high school, I did a lot of LSD. And so that's what really sparked everything for me. It totally changed the way I looked at the world. By the time that I got to college, I went to Cornell and I was actually studying agricultural sciences. And I wanted to grow a lot of these plants and other organisms that produce psychoactive compounds. And so I figured understanding the agricultural side of it would really give me a leg up in that sense. And so I studied agriculture for a while, but in the course of doing that, I took organic chemistry and really fell in love with that and fell in love with the molecular side of things and seeing and understanding how these tiny, tiny molecules that come from these organisms can really have profound influences on human neurochemistry. So I ended up going down that route a little more, chemistry and biology. And so in graduate school, I merged the two. Chemical biology was the name of the discipline that I studied. I was at Harvard for a couple of years. We were looking at different psychiatric disorders, and what we would do is we'd essentially take skin cells from patients who presented with various psychiatric disorders, be it schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and those could be de-differentiated into stem cells, which could then be re-differentiated into neurons. And so without having to go into the patient's brain, you could basically have their neurons growing in a dish in the lab. And then you could see how that particular phenotype of that person with that psychiatric condition compared to a healthy individual's phenotype and see if there were any drugs that could sort of ameliorate disease phenotype to look more like the healthy controls. And so 
that's what I was studying for a couple of years in grad school, but I was eager to uh, get out, enter the industry, and have a sort of more fast-paced environment around me. And so I entered the cannabis space. I would have entered psychedelics right away, actually, but psychedelics weren't really legal, and I couldn't find a reasonable way to enter the psychedelic field. So I entered the cannabis space and was working with a cannabis manufacturer, basically making microdose products and analyzing the different cannabinoids in the product to try to optimize the effect. But in the course of that employment, I ran into someone who was really interested in psychedelics. He was actually from the venture capital world, but he had become so passionate about psychedelics that he was thinking about forming a company around it. And so I wanted to get involved with him. His name is Ronan Levy. And he ended up starting a company called Field Trip. And so I asked if I could join. And here I am today. I'm actually studying psychedelic fungi now. And so it's sort of a dream come true. Uh, my lab is based out of Jamaica because that's where this, this work is legal to do. And so we grow up a whole bunch of different species of psychedelic fungi. And then we break them down, analyze them chemically, and try to see what molecules are in there that might be contributing to the overall psychedelic experience or other non-psychedelic properties that may be beneficial. That's super cool. Are you looking for a therapeutic aspect or are you looking really more at the research side? Yeah, I mean, the long-term goal is definitely therapeutic. The research we're doing right now is definitely basic science research. Like we're not giving these mushrooms to humans or anything like that. We're really trying to understand them at a fundamental chemical level. But the long-term goal would be to translate those findings into people so that when new molecules are discovered or new combinations of molecules are discovered from particular fungi, we could then administer that in a sort of clinical trial kind of setting and see if there is a therapeutic benefit. And I'd like to ask, kind of, what are you finding anything that's kind of really out there? Because I was recently at Science of Consciousness and they were looking actually at studying psychedelics as a way to understand altered states of consciousness. And they were looking particularly at like 5H2 receptor and they were finding, you know, that I thought was quite incredible, you know, particularly in the pineal gland and they were looking at pyramidal cells. Is there something that you've discovered that was unexpected for you considering your background? Something that we are discovering is that there really are tremendous differences between the chemical profiles of these different fungi. And if you look at all the research that's being done right now, it's mostly psilocybin, so the single isolated molecule, and it's synthetic psilocybin. So it's psilocybin made in a lab and then administered to people, usually at a fairly high dose. And what we're finding is that there's a lot more complexity than just psilocybin in these fungi. Whether or not that'll actually translate to experiential differences is an open question, but it certainly seems compelling that there is so much diversity. And these are molecules that look very similar to psilocybin. So in theory, they could have some sort of effect that's similar but not identical to psilocybin and is distinguishable in some way. And if you look into anecdotal reports, between these different species. So people who have consumed species A and species B, they'll report dramatic differences between the two. And it's always hard to sort of tease apart because there's so much influence of expectancy effects. You know, if someone tells you, oh, this species is the best for producing intense visuals or whatever it might be, then you're much more likely to have that sort of experience. And so to really tease that apart, you'd have to do a randomized trial where the person has a double-blind randomized trial where the person has no idea what they're actually getting. And so that would be a long-term goal and something that I'm really excited about is actually see if there are true differences between these or if it's all just a sort of marketing play expectancy effect. But presumably you may see some difference, you know, if you've got your neurons growing on a plate, you may see some differences in the receptor or, or something there where you can make that differentiation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And beyond just the neurons on the dish, you can also see within animal models differences. So, for example, in mice, there's a head twitch response to psychedelic drugs. And so when something agonizes the 5-HT2A receptor, the mouse will start twitching his head. And so it's a really good indicator of how potent of a 5-HT2A T2A receptor agonist a particular psychedelic is. And so in theory, if you administer not just psilocybin, but an extract from these mushrooms that contains these other compounds, you might find that they potentiate or diminish this sort of head switch response, which would imply they're either 
potentiating or diminishing the psychedelic experience in some way in humans. Wow, that's super cool. And do you see that application for humans? Because I know from a point of, you know, from a basic point of view, the science is cool, but everybody wants to know how can they use it to their best advantage. And I know, I mean, here in in the UK, we can't do anything like that. But I was recently in Austin and um, someone was giving me certain very micro dose of uh, actually psilocybin. I don't know what kind of psilocybin, but to have a certain effect and, you know, the effect of this was marketed as being more creative, for example. I mean, how much do you think we can start to use these chemicals already to have these effects? I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the biohacking movement where people are using it for focus, creativity, all of those kind of more, not recreational, I wouldn't say, because it's health optimization, but how close are we to having a tablet you can take, for example, to make you more creative? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think if we look at the cannabis space as an example, there's likely to be a lot of marketing that dominates as opposed to having the science come first and the marketing second. So, for example, a host of cannabis products that claim to have different effects, whether it's uplifting effects or sedating effects or whatever, and chemically many of these products are indistinguishable, and so it's unlikely that they truly have these different effects uh, beyond the consumer being sort of tricked into having that experience through clever marketing. And so I think, I mean, psychedelics are even more conducive to that sort of trickery, if we want to call it that, where... People are especially suggestible, and if you tell them that this particular microdose product is going to enhance their creativity, they're very likely to believe that. And microdosing itself is a great example because there's not a lot of strong evidence to suggest that it truly has a large effect when it's taken at very low doses. So there's also the issue of what is a microdose because that's constantly sort of a point of contention in the space. Is it something that's truly subperceptual where you're not experiencing any sort of change? To your emotional state or your, your waking reality? Or is it something that's perceptual but still functional where I notice there's a difference? Maybe there's mood elevation, something like that, or enhanced creativity, and it's obvious, but it's still clearly perceptual. And so that's sort of, it's difficult to say whether we'll be able to cre- find more chemical nuance that leads to those different effects than there is ability of the marketing to push it in that direction, if that makes sense. So I think there's just so much suggestibility that's there. And I I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, I think it's amazing that the human brain can read that these effects might occur and then have that particular experience just based on the expectation of that experience. Like that's remarkable to me in itself. And so I don't want to underplay the marketing or the placebo effect here, but it's hard to think about whether the chemistry will outweigh that at some point. In terms of microdosing, then, whether you can or you should, or it's right, or it's that, you're, that there's enough to take that it, you can, you know, hit enough, but not too much of the effect of it. Have you found a minimum? And kind of on the other side of that, is there a maximum? Is there too much that you can take, whether it's in one dose or over time, so that it has a long term? negative impact versus the positive impact that it could have on kind of the minimum side of it? Yeah, I mean, it's an open question for sure. And it it depends a lot on the individual because some people have a much larger tolerance than other people. And so it's hard to make a sort of broad dose recommendation. And it also is worth noting that most people are getting these products from the black market. And so you really have no idea what's in there when you're getting them. It might say 100 milligrams of philosophy cubensis mushrooms, but you don't know if that's really what's in there. And there's so much variation batch to batch that you don't know if this batch that you got is really going to be the same as the next batch that you get. And so it's hard to to figure out what doses people are actually taking and how they're influencing them. And then it also depends on the effect that you're going for, because if you want something that's functional where you can go into work and not make silly mistakes, then that's going to be a different dose than if you want to take something at home that really enhances your creativity, but you don't have to socialize or have other encounters that might be prohibitively difficult at higher doses. So I think it's just incredibly difficult to make a a dose recommendation in that way. But I tend to think that stuff that's perceptual will always vastly outperform stuff that's truly sub-perceptual and you're not noticing any kind of difference. And it's also... 
a little less scary to me. Like there is a tendency for these compounds to activate pathways that are also involved in psychotic type disorders like schizophrenia. And that's not a bad thing. To be able to temporarily activate those pathways is probably really healthy and really beneficial. Mm, But to have chronic activation of those pathways could potentially be detrimental. And so if you're taking something at a sub-perceptual level over time, you might not even notice that these changes are occurring until it's too late, you know, and something really bad happens. So that's a fear of mine. I mean, that hasn't really panned out in any sort of study. And so people who are proponents of microdosing will be quick to point out, oh, there's no study that says microdosing is bad and has these health consequences. But that's largely because those studies haven't been done and not enough people have been microdosing. Now that we have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people microdosing, the long-term effects for better or worse will play out at some point. It's interesting. And sort of what you said before about creativity, it could be the same way about other things as well, too, of like, once I bring that into my universe, am I creating that for myself too? I have found though that like, and I've never done a psilocybin in my life, but I definitely have had anxiety with smoking marijuana. And I think, and I just don't do it because once I've had that experience, I now have it over and over and over again. And I'm wondering if there's a way to maintain more control as you're doing these things so that you can enjoy it and it doesn't become an anxious driven and anxiety driven thing. Is there a way for you to understand how you're going to react to a avoid some types of psilocybin or is there a way to do it so you can enjoy it and it not, doesn't become an anxiety thing? Is there something that you can do before you start dosing and you're like, I actually am going to enjoy this one. And is it all positive reinforcement that you tell yourself? I have not found that trick. So I've stopped. It's been two decades for me, but I'm just curious because that to me, you know, that's the enjoyment part is being able to like experience this, but I've never been able to experience this. So how do you, what do you teach people or do you teach people anything, any tricks? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the best you can do is set and setting. And so really optimizing your mindset so that you think, okay, this is going to be positive, enjoyable, and difficult moments might come up, but that's a good thing, and I'll push through it, and I'll really confront those. So, for example, in these studies where they're using high doses of psilocybin, so these are profoundly psychedelic doses of psilocybin, uh, 25 to 30 milligrams, what they tell patients, and these are patients who are suffering from major depressive disorder. And so you'd expect, you know, they're especially prone to having negative experiences on psilocybin because they already have this really depressive outlook. And so what they tell them is trust, let go, be open. And so basically this experience is not going to be purely euphoric and enjoyable the whole time. There might be parts that are tremendously difficult, but those can actually be some of the most healing moments of the journey if you let it happen as opposed to fight it. And so I think there is this tendency when you experience some anxiety or some depressive thinking or whatever it might be during an experience to sort of fight it and say, oh, no, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. But actually, it seems like embracing it is the better option in most cases. But in that context, there's also usually a psychotherapist there. And so in a sort of recreational setting, I think it does help for a lot of people to have a close friend who's had these sorts of experiences and isn't there to judge, but it's just there to help you out and help you through this. If anything difficult does come up, you know, just be basically a hand to hold on to. And so that's the best you can do. But that said, you can't prevent, you know, some people are always going to have a negative experience with psilocybin or with cannabis or whatever, and they just can't enjoy the drug. And you can tell them all you want that these bad experiences are good for you, but maybe they're just not. And maybe that person will never have a great experience. And that's fine. That's something that people just have to find out on their own. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think kind of similar to what you said about opening those pathways, I think once you open that pathway, I unlocked this anxiety attack and I was starting to have them just in everyday life. And I sort of think opened up a pathway to, to anxiety. And it was very strange for me. And I kind of go to the other part of that question is, is there too much? Is there too much that you've seen? Or is it all kind of based on the individual and who they are? I mean, because I, psilocybin's do, do get, you know, a bad rap for that, right? That, oh, it's, you know, you do too much, you're going to have flashbacks. And all of a sudden you ruined yourself. Like, I can't imagine that's the same case for everybody. But is there too much? Is there a balance? I'm curious on that end. 
Yeah, like the really negative experiences and the flashbacks and those sorts of things, they haven't been seen in the clinical trials with high doses of psilocybin. So it does seem like if you put the appropriate container around the experience, then you're not likely to get those sorts of negative outcomes, even if there are very, very difficult moments during the experience. Like some of these patients do report that during the experience, they experience some of the most difficult things in their life that they've ever experienced. And so it's not to say it's an easy euphoric experience, but they don't have these lasting negative consequences. And in fact, it tends to be the opposite, where they have insights into their own psyche that proved to be tremendously beneficial and help them oftentimes fight off disorders like depression. And so I do think with the right container, you can really prevent a lot of that and not all of that and not for every individual. But in most cases, I think the right container will be tremendously helpful. Yeah, that's a fascinating observation that it's not seen in those clinical settings because there you go, it's all context specific. Do you think there's a bit of a renaissance of of the psychedelic drugs coming, Marshall? Because wherever I go now, it always seems to be one of the hot topics in any discussion, whether it's biohacking or consciousness or psychology or psychiatry. It seems like psychedelics are coming back into favor after kind of, you know, nobody being able to even do research on them. Now, all of a sudden, you know, a lot of the big universities are kind of getting funding to do research on these drugs. Why do you think there is that change and what do you think that impact could potentially be? Yeah, so there's definitely this sense that there is a psychedelic renaissance. I'd say, I mean, it's very palpable from my end because I'm just so in it every day. But even, you know, big media outlets seem to be publishing more often on the positive results from various psychedelic trials and whatnot. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that psychedelics are now really being medicalized. And so the way they're being approached now is is these treatments for really severe psychiatric conditions that everyone's been exposed to in some way or another. You know, like everyone knows someone who's suffered from depression or anxiety or PTSD. And so I think we immediately understand that if these drugs can be almost curative or the closest we have to cure for some of those conditions, then why not pursue them in this very careful, medicalized way? In a way, that's really great thing to be able to provide this. In another way, it sort of sterilizes the experience because now it's very much, you have to follow particular protocols, you know, a particular dose in a particular setting. It sort of medicalizes and standardizes the whole thing. And this is an experience that's not so conducive to standardization, especially at the higher doses. And so, I hope that there's going to be a lot of room that opens up for non-standard experiences when we talk about things like recreational or wellness markets that aren't so strictly medical. And so that's the side where I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Like we know there's going to be this medical side for psychedelics and this huge medical role that they're going to play. It's almost undoubtable at this point. But then is there going to be a strong wellness recreational spiritual enhancement, whatever you want to call it, this this non-medical side of psychedelics that's happening not just in a black market kind of setting, but in in a truly legal setting. Yeah, you're right. Because most people who've kind of had a really experience that's profoundly affected them have gone somewhere like Peru or done it with shamans. You have an experience which is more than just the drug. You know, it's the whole community it's the ritual like you say it's the spiritual aspect and I can see what you mean you know if that part is removed from the experience you know is that actually a fundamental part of it because the whole thing about psychedelics is it connects you with you know maybe with something bigger so if you standardize it and sterilize it too much are you kind of missing the point a little bit yeah and to the credit of a lot of these researchers they are trying to impart some of that shamanic wisdom, if you will, into the way that they're conducting these trials. But that said, everything still has to be very controlled in a way that it wouldn't be for better or worse if you go down to one of those places in South America or just have the experience, you know, out in nature with your friends. Yeah, it's different. I'm curious, what are some of the magical things that you've discovered, like what are some of the discoveries that you're really excited about that people don't know about? I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, since you're doing research on this, what are some of the things that you're really excited about that you're discovering that really haven't been shared in the wider world out there? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the 
more exciting discoveries is this molecule that we're pursuing in the drug development arm of field trip. And that molecule is essentially similar to psilocybin and then it activates the, its primary mechanism of action is activation of the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the receptor that's involved in generating these psychedelic experiences. But it has a much shorter duration than psilocybin. So the whole experience tends to last two to three hours, whereas with psilocybin, it tends to last six to eight hours. And so it's a lot less clinically cumbersome, both for the clinician and also for the patient who might come in for one of these experiences. And so that to me is exciting. Or the open question that we're addressing that's really exciting is, can this have as big of an effect if you shorten the duration of an experience in this way? Can it really have the same sort of antidepressant benefits that we're seeing with the high dose, long duration experiences? And where is that optimal point? Because other drugs like DMT or 5-methoxy DMT, when they're smoked, the experience is, you know, 15 to 30 minutes. And people report an antidepressant effect, but some people report that they couldn't really get anything out of the experience because it, you know, came on and they came down so fast that they can't even remember the majority of it. And so there's some optimal dose duration combination that's likely. And so this new drug that we're pursuing, I'm particularly excited about to see if that hits a sort of sweet spot. Cool. And what about your own personal experience, Marshall? Have you kind of had any personal revelations or what's the benefit that you felt for yourself from kind of actively taking these chemicals? Yeah, well, when I took them most heavily, it was during a pretty formative time in my life because, you know, I was in high school, had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And they just totally challenged my notion of reality, I guess I'd say. it's They dissolved any sort of learned boundaries between me and anything else in the world. And so I came to see how much, I guess, is learned. And we don't tend to realize that. I don't think without the help of either intense meditation or taking something like a psychedelic drug. And so to give a sort of trivial example, when I'm out on a hike and I'm looking at the ground, say I'm hiking up a dirt trail, it tends to appear to be, you know, one, two, maybe three shades of brown that I'm seeing on the dirt trail. When I'm doing the exact same hike under the influence of a psychedelic, I all of a sudden get 50 to 60 different shades of brown. And I think that's actually a truer reflection of what's on the ground. But, you know, in everyday non-psychedelic reality, your brain is sort of taking an average of all those browns, giving you the one or two browns that you really need. Because who cares if there's 50 shades, right? That would be the argument. When we're talking about survival, it really doesn't matter. And you get an overwhelming surge of stimuli if you really could see and feel and hear everything that's out there. And so with psychedelics, to me, at least, it feels like you're removing that sort of barrier that the brain normally puts in for the sake of survival. And you're able to perceive more total reality that's likely truer to the way it actually exists. And so being able to feel that and sense that it's there, that was really powerful for me. And now I can tap into that even without the help of psychedelic drugs from time to time. Psychedelics are still the best way to really get the full picture for me. But I find, I mean, I take them way less than I used to, and I still find that the insights that I had are really valuable and keep me eternally optimistic, I would say. <laughs> That's super cool. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it, I suppose. Once you realize your mind's expanded and you kind of have that awareness, that's it. You have the awareness, you know, your brain can make that switch. I, I Someone once gave me a trip when I was very young and I didn't think it had done anything at all. But then I went into this like student room and they had all these Kandinsky pictures on the wall. And I suddenly understood like this abstract art. And I was like, oh, that is what they were trying to do. And that's never left me. Like now when I look at some of these pictures, I kind of feel like I can go back and remember how that felt to understand this art a little bit more. So I know what you mean. You kind of, even when you're not taking anything, then you realize, okay, I remind myself that I'm filtering the environment. Maybe I can expand in a way that your brain remembers because, you know, you've already been there in your brain. So that's super cool. It's sort of what you said before, Marshall, about opening up those pathways and you don't really ever close those pathways, but now they're open and you've experienced them. It's like meditation 
but at a much larger degree, it's once you've experienced the you know, presence and being in the present and understanding that, I think it's probably very similar that you can't really turn that off once you've experienced it. Yeah, yeah definitely. And in, I mean, I was going to say, you can meditate with, you know, the more things that you do, you know, if you're taking a, a high or a low dose psychedelic and doing the meditation, you know, you get that enhanced effect. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I liken it a lot of times to development too. And, you know, children have probably a very psychedelic view of the world when they're particularly young, you know, like right out of the womb, you've probably got all these stimuli coming in before your brain really knows how to make sense of them. And then over time, synapses are pruned and the brain is basically set up to have a more rigid view of the world that's much more conducive to survival. But psychedelics sort of let us tap into that childhood state where the view of the world isn't so rigid. And and that is really helpful, especially, I mean, if you think of it in the context of psychiatric disorders like depression, that's truly a pathway that you're stuck in, you're so stuck in, and you really can't escape, whether it's negative thoughts about yourself, the environment, or all of the above. And psychedelics allow, you know, a temporarily a temporary relief from that, allow you to see the world from a different perspective. And then with the appropriate integration afterwards, it seems like these patients are really getting a tremendous benefit and able to rewire, hopefully permanently, but at the very least for a few months, their brains after a single dose. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Marshall, did you want to talk at all about Field Trip and the company? I, I think doing some of the research, it's a fascinating company, and I'm wondering if you wanted to spend any time talking about it. Yeah, sure. So Field Trip, when we started, we really didn't know what the company was going to look like. I mean, I joined when there were less than 10 employees, and everyone was super passionate about psychedelics. We knew that this was going to be big but had no idea, you know, what the right way to approach it was, especially given the legal barriers around it. And so what ended up happening is we basically formed three verticals for the company. And so there's the basic side, which is the part of the company that I'm most involved in, where we're doing the research on these organisms that produce psychedelic drugs and really trying to understand them at a fundamental level. Then there's a drug development arm where we're taking the clinical trial route to try to get new psychedelic drugs approved for the treatment of various disorders. And we're hoping that those psychedelics have particular benefits over the ones that are currently being pursued, like psilocybin and MDMA. And then we have another vertical, which is our clinical infrastructure. And that's where we're setting up these spaces, these containers to actually administer psychedelics and provide these beautiful psychedelic experiences. And so right now, we actually have those clinics operational throughout the U.S. and Canada, and one in the Netherlands as well, where we administer ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And so we use ketamine as a psychedelic in this case, but as soon as psilocybin or another psychedelic makes it through clinical trials, we'll be able to administer those as well in these sort of beautiful spaces that are intended to treat people with psychiatric disorders, but are not intended to feel like medical settings. So they feel like these, you know, beautiful, almost spa-like settings where people are more likely to have these psychedelic experiences that are conducive to healing and growth. And so those are the three sorts of verticals of the company. And and that's what we're pursuing right now. And I imagine you are doing these, you have to do these in person, correct? These are in-person type treatments? Yeah. The psychedelic experiences. Yeah. Even so, sort of the individual treatments that you have there. I mean, I'm reading about some of the ketamine pieces. Like those are all things you probably want to do in person. You have a, you know, a professional there with you as well, I imagine. Yeah. It's all professionally guided. And, you know, we have training programs for all our psychotherapists and all our nurses and everything. And so there's a, it's really professionalized for sure. And there's a lot of one-on-one care. And so one of the most important aspects of the actual treatment is developing that relationship with the psychotherapist. And so a lot of effort is put into that because if you have an incredibly positive relationship with any human being and you're working with that person through a psychedelic experience, you're much more likely to have a positive outcome than if you have, you know, a negative or there are any sort of barriers in your relationship. Yeah, that's That's super cool. I mean, that's absolutely fabulous work because, you know, that's really bringing back personal medicine for people plus like you say doing it where it's outside of the clinic and you know you're not giving someone a toxic drug you're giving them something that you know is going to have that effect and you're doing it in that fabulous setting I actually go to the Netherlands a lot so I'll go and 
check the place out because I'm all for anything which, you know, brings connection back into medicine. Because you're right, probably half of the therapy is the connection with the person, I, I would think. Like you're saying, you know, you don't have the same effect if you don't have the connection with the person. That's because, you know, we're humans and human connection is so important. Then you're having the effect also of the drug. I mean, that's super cool. It's brilliant work. It's brilliant work because there really isn't anything else for a lot of people with psychiatric illness and depression. You know, really, the other orthodox drugs are not working for that. So, yeah, that's brilliant to be able to be bringing that out. Yeah. And one of the biggest benefits of psychedelics as opposed to the typically prescribed antidepressants like SSRIs is that they work. When they do work, they work incredibly quickly. So within a matter of hours, a patient will feel relief. And then they work generally for at least a couple months. Some people are finding relief for years after a single dosing session. And so it's very different to this, you know, take one or two pills a day every day for years. And, you know, maybe in a few weeks you'll feel a benefit. Maybe it'll get worse and we'll have to switch you between different drugs before you really find the one that works right for you. It seems like psychedelics, when they do work, have a much more powerful and immediate and lasting effect than typically prescribed drugs. Yeah. And because you're giving less of the drug, presumably the side effects are so much less. You know, if you're giving somebody, you know, even like one dose or maybe even a dose over a few months, that's so much reduced compared to somebody being on antidepressants for years. Absolutely. And I mean, all that kind of ties back to microdosing, where one of the things that worries me a bit about microdosing is because it tends to be more chronic than these single high dose experiences. The possibility for side effects is definitely heightened in those cases. That's not to say that they always happen and there's, you know, terrible effects, but for, you know, they're more more likely when you're taking a drug in that way where it's every day or even, you know, three days a week, whatever it might be, you're much more likely to get side effects than if you're taking a drug once every few months. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, good point. That is fascinating. And I, yeah, I think that we, you know, it's something that when we want to leave people with tips here and a lot of the impacts of understanding is, is, you know, experimentation. I think this is one where I think you're giving forewarning that maybe microdosing might not be, we haven't been able to establish whether it's good or not, whether it really is opening up those pathways to creativity, or if you're just telling yourself they are. And why don't you just try telling yourself they are and see if that works? <laughs> why don't you just try telling yourself, course, I'm creative. You're I'm just very cautious, today. Russ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. I'm very cautious, but, but I don't think I was when I was younger. I think no. I just had this experience that yes, was so negative. Course. But exactly what you said, Marshall, like, it's the attitude and approach that when you go in and I think breaking down that stigma um, and I think field trip, how I think it's fieldtriphealth.com is your company site, but breaking down that stigma and allowing people to understand that there's someone there with you. So if things start to go awry, that you have someone you can trust, which I think is an important tip to leave people with and that there are really amazing things happening here. And I, I think that's something that I'm excited about and excited to share that there's a lot happening with things that you might see as recreational. These things are now being moved over to research science and and potentially going to you know help people for a very long time. So it is really fascinating. Yeah, thank you, Marshall, for coming on and bringing your expertise. A lot of that I say a lot of it's a buzzword now, psychedelics, and I think people are kind of jumping a little bit on the bandwagon. But actually, there's such credible research going on, and it's so you know even the kind of revival in interest in things like mushrooms, you know, just as a plant. You know, there's mu- people are much more interested now in plant biology and how mushrooms are actually you know this amazing organism. So now you know finding out that we can get these different compounds from different types of fungi, it's really kind of next level stuff. So yeah, that's super cool to actually have you come on and speak from your own experience of the research thank you yeah of course thank you both for having me and inviting me to this pleasure we we will put we'll put up a link and uh yeah thanks again marshall thank you thank you the rebel scientist podcast is a breaking the gray production hosted by sarah turner and russ eisenman audio production by dave visaya and the podcast engineers For more information and for our biohacking shopping guide, visit rebelscientist.com. To hear more incredible Breaking the Gray production podcasts, visit breakingthegray.com. That's gray with an E. 
breakingthegray.com.